Tamar Adler. So good to see you again. Welcome to Longer Tables. Thank you. It's great to see you. I had here um, three days ago, the only the one, Alice Waters, in my house, having breakfast. I know you work at uh, Japanese. That was one of your or your gigs, uh, of your restaurants, uh, many others, uh, like Prune in New York. Um, my God, your, 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 your new cookbook, The Everlasting Meal. Uh, I mean, when you have somebody like Michael Pollan, very much saying the best book on cooking with economy and grace, he's read science, MFK Fisher. I mean, when you have Michael Pollan on top of that, also pricing you like this is like, oh my God, what else? What else can you go? So yeah, you, you are a veteran all around cook. And when I say that people are cooks, I call myself a cook. I say cook with capital letters, cooks, cooks. People have the way to transform the goodness of the earth. Uh, what I really want to know, what everybody in Longer Tables wants to know is how, when was that moment in, in your life that somehow you realize, oh my God, being around food and cooking, it's who I want to be, is what I want to do. How, how, how and when was that moment? You remember? That's a good question. I think I answer it differently every time I answer it, but that's okay because it's probably an iterative process, right? I think you probably realize it and then and then think, no, that's not it, and then realize it again and again. But there was, there, I was an editor at Harper's Magazine um, which I loved. And I loved, uh, I loved working with words. I loved the magazine. I loved everything about it. And I was still spending all of my time thinking about food, going home and cooking. I got, I would go to the farmer's market in Union Square for all of the editors. I was like really developing a passion. And then it kind of became like an affair because I, um, started petitioning Gabrielle Hamilton to let me cook at prune but in secret. So I would go, and it took a lot of petitioning, actually. Um, she was always like somehow not there. I would walk to the restaurant, she was not there. And then one day, as I was leaving, somebody felt really bad for me and they, I think it was the pastry chef. She said, you know, if you're an editor, why don't you just write her a letter? And, um, and I was like, okay, great. I wrote her a letter. I walked it back over to Prune. And then by the time I got back to my office, there was a blinking, light on my phone, like an old telephone. And there was a message from her saying, I got your letter, you know, come back. So I went back over and she said, um, I can't teach you how to cook. This is a small restaurant. You can't like peel lots of carrots because we don't have that many carrots. And um, I kind of didn't take no for an answer and was like, let just see if I can be helpful. And she let me show up that Saturday. And starting that Saturday, I had a totally secret double life where I was a cook at Prune on Saturdays and then I was an editor during the week. Um, and it was that at some point I was like, Gabrielle wanted to move me up the line because I was on the grill and she was like, well, just try saute. And I felt like I had to pick an identity, you know, like either a cook or an editor. I felt like I was lying to everyone. And um, I chose being an editor. I told her that I thought I should go back to just, you know, working harder at the magazine, which I did for about a month and then I quit. I think that was the moment. I was back at the magazine and I, I, it was like in the, I think in the absence of all of that stuff that I had been exposed to in the kitchen, I understood what I really loved. And so after she had said to me, Godspeed, such a good idea, don't be a cook, go be an editor. I said, great. And then I went back to Harper's and then I quit. Uh, and I've been a cook ever since. <laughs> how, how old were you when that happened? If can I uh, ask? 20, of course. Um, I was 24 or 25. All right. But then, then I have a feeling this is way ahead in your life. Uh, I would love to know, we would love to know what, if anything, early, early childhood memories, a moment, a smell, putting your finger in a jar, licking that finger and saying, oh my God, 
that moment, I, I had my moment. I, 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 I tell many stories. My daughters tell me, Daddy, you never tell the same story twice well, because I had many. But that moment that uh, an uncle of mine, uh, I only met once, uh, he was making these breadcrumbs, saute with some rancid pork fat. And, and, those, <laughs> and those migas, those breadcrumbs of all bread. Oh, oh my God. That, that was, I was eating bread. Use hot saute bread, I, I was like extraordinary, and I was really, really young. Uh, it's Help. memories that just came to me later. What what moment of serendipity? What moment you had that maybe you are gonna remember right now? I'm uh, as I'm describing to you those mm. moments of my childhood. Um, wait, how old were you when you had the breadcrumb? Oh my God, the probably name? was seven, eight, nine, seven, maybe more seven than nine. Young. So really young, really young. Uh, the, honestly, the first one I can think of w is when I really didn't like food as a child. I okay. and I had such a sensitive. I still have a really sensitive sense of smell, and I think all my senses are quite. Uh, but they're strong, and I always had such a strong sense of smell that I remember um, the smell of fennel was really overwhelming, and I could not be close to fennel seed, fennel set anything. Um, and there were a few, like, certain tastes and smells and even sounds were just freak me out. And it really, and I hated food. I had to get, my mom would uh, make me carnation in, instant breakfast, which is like a, like a mix that you put in a, like, milk and then a packet and you mix it up and it's like a thousand calories and it tastes like crappy chocolate. And just, just so I could, so I would eat something. But then I went to Paris when I was 13 and thankfully, I could eat for every meal. I was somehow able to get steak and French fries. So I was over the moon. Um, and then after a few meals of steak and French fries, we went to a restaurant and they served us. A, I must have been like a prefix menu because I don't think we could. I wouldn't have ordered this soup. But there was a soup that was light green. So it might have been asparagus. It might have been pea. And there was a single morel mushroom cut crossways so it looks like a little ring or at Chez Panisse we used to call them cat buttholes because they kind of look like a cat cat's butthole but um there was a single cat's morel butthole. floating <laughs> I mean it's gross especially That's when you're like <laughs> yeah I know and we would put them on pizza um, anyway anyway maybe matter. it was a leg soup maybe it was a leg soup uh, if you use the green part of the leeks also the soup it might have been a leek soup. kind of beautiful greenish color is not always the perfect white beachy was cold soup that everybody always yeah. describe. So and that I moment that moment in, I taste in Paris. It's not yes. a bad place in Paris yeah. to to fall in love as a young teenager. Yeah. Fall yeah. in love with uh, uh, a steak and, and French fries. It's not a bad place. And half avocado. I also love that you get an avocado half with vinaigrette. So like my meal was always at half an avocado with vinaigrette and then steak and french fries. And then I had the soup, which I, I should like try to recreate it. It probably, it was very, very simple. Just a totally pureed, clear, beautiful soup with that single morel. The single poor morel. The single And we forget butthole. the morels, they grow together. I have, I have morels actually in my kitchen. I, I use, bought them in the farmer's market uh, these last, uh, Sunday. Maybe yeah, you should I try love... to make the soup. Make the soup. I'll, okay, I'll, I'll follow. I'll follow the the soup. I don't have leeks, but I don't have green peas. Okay, I'll figure out something. <laughs> but we want to know. We want to know more. So, so obviously we we I already mentioned uh, Chef Panis, obviously prune, but but really to understand how these restaurants uh, you work uh, you work it kind of uh, shape who you are as a person, as a cook, uh, as, as, as a writer, uh, uh, and especially how you develop this kind of love for what seems everybody hates. Uh, even I don't think uh, leftovers are something anybody hates because very often everybody tells you, I love the leftovers. <laughs> but here so we are talking about the, the ugly fruits and vegetables or the leftovers of leftovers. I have a feeling we all have 
uh, uh, asparagus that we all cut and we eat the tips. And somehow, because we feel guilty, we keep the rest of the stems of the asparagus and we put them in the fridge and they may be there for days, if no weeks or more. Uh, where, where, where that's what we want to know that the, the restaurants you were, how, how they shape who, who you are as, as the, uh, when you write, obviously you, you are expressing your experiences, your love affair, your romance with those ingredients, but specifically how you got to, to get into the life of leftovers. I think that, so I've cooked at three, kind of four restaurants. I was um, three or four restaurants and I am super lucky in that all of them were really, um, it wasn't that they were committed to using all of everything for like some philosophical purpose, uh, but it was pretty integral to the actual sort of menu of every place that I ever worked. Um, that, that everything be used. I had, I ran a restaurant in Georgia that was my own restaurant in between Prune and Chez Panisse. And we had no money. I mean, we were, you know, like we- What was were, the name of the restaurant? It was called Farm 255. It was oh, Farm around- Farm 255. Like, and this was your restaurant? Yeah. Farm 255. Mm -hmm. it, was, um, it was in Athens, Georgia. And I was, I was an investor. I mean, not, you know, a few thousand dollars in the restaurant when it opened. And then I went down to help them open. Um, I was living in New York and I went down just to like be an extra set of hands. And I walked into the restaurant and I fell in love. Like I was falling in love with a person. I couldn't leave the restaurant. And, um, I quickly became the chef of the restaurant because they had hired a really terrible chef who did really, really bad things to green beans. And he put black pepper on everything. Anyway, we fired him. I was the chef, but we were very, very, it was a really tight budget and so we so, so you go for a few days and there boom you end as staying as the chef de cuisine yeah i actually called i was working for dan barber um at that point but in a research capacity and he was another one of the chefs i would i would go and work at stone barns in the kitchen just just to like learn stuff sometimes not not on the payroll just to help out um but i was his research assistant and i called him after one day in georgia and said i have to quit because i have to I have to run away with this restaurant. Tamara, I see it's a pattern here. You, you go a few days, uh, you, you totally. volunteer in, in New York in a restaurant Saturday, but you make your mind, you go back to your business, you are the editor, and all of a sudden you start writing. A, no, I don't want to do this. I'm going back to cooking. You go one day to Athens, used to check on the restaurant, you invested some money, and boom, you change everything, and you stay as a chef. Wow, uh, your life. I'm really very impulsive. Yeah, yeah, it's true. No, that's right. You follow your feelings and your emotions right there. It, and this, food is always around. Yeah, and the same thing happened at Chez Panisse, actually. I went out there. Um, I, I just went to visit Chez Panisse. Uh, I was leaving the restaurant in Georgia. I was there for a year and a half, and I went to visit Chez Panisse. And I cooked in a few kitchens. I cooked at Quince for a couple of days and at Pizzaiolo, and I butchered a little bit. I was just getting experience, and I spent one day at Chez Panisse, and met with my friend Cal Peternell and his co-chef at the time, Leah Puidokas, and I said, I really feel like I belong here. I feel something like a natural connection. And they were like, okay, let's think about it. And then a week later, one of their cooks had to take maternity leave because she was having like, she was pregnant and she had um, preeclampsia. She was having issues with her pregnancy. And so I had just said to them, like, I belong here. Will you keep me? And then a cook went down. So I got to stay. Yeah. Okay. But let me go very quickly. Farm two to five. You arrive yeah. to help. You're an investor of, with other friends. You stay there. You become the head chef. What was the menu like? What, what was the first menu you put together? Did you, did, did you cut off every menu item because the chefs before was mistreating green beans or fava beans or whatever? Uh, what, what did you do to them? You began talking to the ingredients? You, did you? What, what, <laughs> what? Intimate conversations. Well, okay, a couple of things. Yeah, a couple of things happened. One was I um, stopped. Yes, he was mistreating green beans. And so I stopped that right there. But I also uh, made everything a lot easier. And I cut the menu in half. Um, 
because could, could it be that the poor chef, uh, his mother, his father, when he was younger, uh, put down their throat like if he was a geese or a duck putting down the corn, uh, 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 and uh, the green winds were so bad that. Poor person, 10, 20 years later, had this kind of uh, hate relationship with the green beans. I mean, were you totally. not too hard to? Yeah. Maybe. No you're, no, you're right. I didn't consider the context or his circumstances. He might have been punished by green beans, and then he was just punishing them back. That is totally possible. However, he had other behaviors that were less comical. He would get hammered before every um, service. And he would like to say lewd things to the female cooks. So they were, in addition, mm. the green beans were just the final straw. I get it. You know, it. it was like, you can't do all of this and then do that to green beans, no matter how badly you've been treated by them in the past. But it just, everything was a little complicated. So I, um, I made the menu a lot easier. I started, um, I, for, for budgetary reasons, I started grinding. We were buying only whole animals. And I started grinding most of the cow. So that we could we could use we could have burgers. So we had really amazing burgers, and that changed um, everything. We did not have burgers before. Uh, the the way I had animals butchered was one of the first things I I changed to make things like easier and more replicable. And we put burgers and sausages on the menu. And instead of having three olive oils, I cut us down to one olive oil. Um, yeah, I just made things it's, simple, it's and we used it it's all. Streamlining. Streamlining. And were, <laughs> and were you the the chef that calls the tickets uh, from behind uh, the kitchen on the pass, or were the you the expediter? Yeah, right. Were you the expediter, or were you right there manning a station and the pots and pans? I well, I started on saute. I did I did all the stations, and then once I could do them all, I started expediting. It was a very it was a real shoestring operation. I'm glad that you never ate there. I mean, I would have loved it at the time, but you know who did eat there and who loved it? Michael Stipe. Wow. Isn't that amazing? Wow. So he, you know, he lives in Athens and he, I think he luckily held off for enough months. I think he like got back into town while we were doing really terrible things to food. And then, but he used to come in and I remember the salad he would get. He would get, we, we got um, sugar loaf chicories, which are those long, pante zucchero, the long, beautiful chicories. And I was cutting them and grilling them. And then we would do a warm vinaigrette with chickpeas, like a warm, the pickup would be like the, you know. I love chickpeas. A, me too. And on, on, on the chicory, it was so good. And sometimes we'd have grilled squid and he would always get it. And he would always come in right when we were finishing service. And so my cooks always called it getting stiped. They'd be like, oh, we're getting <laughs> stiped. Cause he'd come the, in at 9.59, they'd be pulling yeah. at mats. Did he got inspired maybe any of the songs? He did the writing right there in your table in your restaurant? I wonder. Night swimming. What's it? Yeah, I don't know. Farm 255 five inspired. <laughs> oh my God. Who knows? We need to ask him. Yeah, I'm going to try to have him on. You can find him. out. Yeah. So obviously, uh, who you are in your books, the restaurants you've been, uh, uh, I would love to, to take your your feeling on seems like a lot of people um, think that, you know, cooking and eating sustainable is kind of hard work. It's almost like a sacrifice when it should be happening natural. Uh, feeding you and your family and your friends shouldn't be something hard. Uh, but but, but uh, your perspective, uh, I have a feeling, um, will be different than mine or any other. No, so... So tell me how you arrived to this very simple understanding that yes, that you can have fun, that you can feed your friends, yourself, your family, sustainable, that you can be using leftovers uh, in a fun way where everything is important. The super great cow that you butcher on your own and you use every single part, but also the, the leftover lick tips that you're making something amazing because it's the last thing you had in the refrigerator. Tell me about your philosophy. Okay, but then I want to hear about yours. Um, well, I think I think that I've had really great. Um, I think I've been influenced by useful teachers in this way. Like Alice, you know, I know that Alice Waters has been called unrealistic and overly idealistic and lots of stuff. And I completely understand uh, well those arguments. I've I've heard them. I understand them. Um, I also think it's really it's been incredibly valuable to me 
that I cooked for a while in a kitchen where the, you're never shooting for what I think of now as big food, performative food. The, the, the food at Chez Panisse is incredibly simple. And in Alice's way of, you know, viewing the world, viewing ingredients, just a boiled egg, a boiled egg and a, a tangle of greens with good vinaigrette and a boiled vegetable is like as good as it gets. And that having somebody who has such influence in the food world and who is so well respected telling me through the chefs that I cooked with there again and again, just this is enough and this counts and you can, you can respect this and you can love it was really meaningful. And there's actually, uh, I think there's still this magazine. There was a, there was a magazine called Monocle, which is a British magazine. And like 10 years ago or something, when I first, no, that's not, yes, that is true. Um, or more. I moved back to New York from Berkeley and Alice was coming through town and she was asked by Monocle to do like the, her last meal on earth, what was going to her her last meal before she died. And, um, and I cooked it not because she was like, Oh, I need tomorrow Adler to cook the meal, but it was like sh for the, sh you know, for the shoot and for the, the magazine said she cooked it, but it was like, I cooked the meal and what she chose was polentina, which is literally chicken broth with like green garlic cooked in it and a bay leaf and then just a little polenta. So like, you know, a half a cup of polenta makes a pot of soup. And then boiled eggs, boiled asparagus, toast and salad. And, you know, bandol rosé. And I feel like it actually helped me enormously that that her philosophy was, you know, that that enjoying food is not about like doing the most performative thing, but about um finding something that's good and just turning it from, from raw to cooked. Um, and I think that's what I, that's what I do. And there was also a period when I had quit Chez Panisse and I was teaching butchery classes in the Bay area and I was like writing little bits and bobs, but I had no real income. Um, and what I, the way I fed myself was I would cook like one shift at Chez Panisse and then at the end of the night cooks can bring home like leftovers. So I could bring home, and from, so for my butchery, my butchery classes, I would bring home like the, we'd butcher a, a lamb leg and I would teach people how to take all the muscles off, but then I would take the bone home and I would leave my shift at Chez Panisse and I would get like a little bit of, you know, cooked polenta. And just, I, for about six months, I sort of made it work with the Chez Panisse leftovers and the butchery bones. And I think all of that together really helped inform my understanding that it's doable. And even then when I was in, in Berkeley, like in the heart of, you know, the sustainable food movement, people would come over my house for dinner and be like so relieved and overjoyed and amused that I would sometimes serve them scrambled eggs and toast. You know, like I think there just aren't that many examples other than, than Chez Panisse of people doing it really simply. And just, you know, if I didn't have enough, you know, money or time to make something, I would just, you know, scramble eggs, which seems great. That's creative. So on your new, <laughs> on, the, on your new cookbook, the Everlasting Meal Cookbook, Leftovers A to C, I guess there you have uh, recipes that you uh, came your way and you took a note and you kept them there until you brought the book. Uh, uh, other ones that you were researching and working. Okay, what can we do with leftovers of this, of that? Because you were writing a book in a professional way. But what I want to know is if you can give me a recent example in your everyday life that something that happened that actually you were in somebody's home or whatever, or you were at your home and, and you use leftovers in a fun, creative way that even it surprised you, the new queen of leftovers. <laughs> well, I mean, this is really good timing because actually... Uh... Adam Sachs, who uh, used to be the editor of Sever Magazine, threw a party at his house a few days ago and um, let me into his house and let me invite a bunch of other cooks. And we made stuff out of leftovers. Um, and uh, His leftovers, is, whatever he had in the fridge. Or whatever. So Adam Kay, who uh, has a great company called The Spare Food Company, was one of the... Um, was one of the chefs and he had gone around to the, like the back of farmer's market stands and asked them for whatever they didn't want to put out in the farmer's market stall. So he got like all of these 
odds and ends of greens. And then we used asparagus bottoms and like just every green scrap imaginable. And he made the most delicious soup like ever out of that. And it was, I couldn't, it was, it was one of the best things we ate that night. And it was all things that they wouldn't even sell at the farmer's market. Um, and I've started making something that's in my cookbook that's called Yam Kai, which is like a, it's like a fried, it's a fried rice salad, but it's like a great thing to do when you have a lot of vegetables and just a little bit of leftover rice. Um, when the rice gets super crispy and it ends up sort of in big pieces. Uh, and Cal Peternell, who's my old boss from Chez Panisse, came and he brought a cup of leftover rice um, to make the, the Yam Kai from the book. Uh, and I made croquetas. You made croquetas? I made croquetas and they were really good. I think. And I mean, the, the, you made the, the breadcrumbs too? Yeah. I my, made the my breadcrumbs. I used to use the coffee grinder to make the breadcrumbs. Oh, that's smart. Yeah. I, I, I found a really big bag of breadcrumbs in my freezer. Uh, and I had to go to Manhattan. I live in upstate New York and I brought the entire bag of breadcrumbs in my suitcase to Adam Sachs's house and in, along with a bit of leftover Easter ham. And, and the was, croquetas were bechamel base or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, were, they were bechamel and the tops of green garlic because, you know, you could use the bottom for something else, but like the green, the green tops. And then I found a half an onion um, and they were amazing. And I used up all the Easter ham. I, I tell this story so often, probably people just laugh at me when I tell it again. But croqueta, my mom, I think she was the queen of croquetas. Her croquetas were so amazing. It was so difficult used to bread them because the bechamel was so oh. loosey loose. And, oh my God, they, they were so good. You couldn't handle them. You couldn't. Because even the breadcrumbs were so fine that the croqueta wouldn't hold itself. Uh, that's how loose they were. Uh, and those croquetas were fascinating. Could you, you can you do big. it? Can you, can yeah, you for the restaurant it's hard. I do it when we make them at home for my daughters. They, 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 we never fill up the plate because as they come out of the, of the pan where I'm frying them, use in the moment they get cool, a little bit cooled down, oh, everybody's eating them. Wait, so what's the secret? How can you, I, I have completely struggled with this and I make a much stiffer bechamel because let's, I, yeah. Let's flower wins the day and making sure it's as cold as you can. And obviously now everybody, chefs all over. I mean, in Spain, chefs really are in a competition about who makes the best croquetas, <gasps> even, even high-end restaurants. is. So it's funny. I love that you made croquetas, but I can tell you, Spain. Oh my God! It's, it's like everybody is competing about who makes the best croqueta, which is, is so many that are, are good. Every everyone, if it's if it's made with love, is good. Thicker ones, smaller ones, bigger ones, chicken, nothing, egg. My mom will make one that will be only boiled egg, and those were so good. Really? So good. Okay, so croquetas. I love croquetas. <laughs> um, so, so listen, uh, let's go to everybody cooks at home or they try to cook at home. Sometimes people overcomplicate their lives and, and especially when you invite more than two people. Sometimes I'm very picky with my wife or, uh, when, or my daughters when they are bringing people home and I tell them I want to cook for four. And then they tell me, yeah, but uh, can I bring two more people? It's six. And I say, no, because it's 50% more work. <laughs> people don't realize that. Uh, you need to ask yourself what you think you can handle for what you want to make today. Uh, but, uh, but I love to do, to do parties. And I know you've written often about great dinner parties. Any, any, sharing any of your experience about, about uh, how to do a great party that is fun, interesting, but in the process, you, you don't drown. You, you don't end the party like saying, what did I do? What did I invite anybody in the first place? What should be the recommendation for people that do a party when they finish, they finish proud of themselves, enjoying themselves, enjoying the food, and more important, the guest. And so they don't go like sometimes happens to us, like, I'm never inviting anybody home again in my entire life. <laughs> that was the last party ever. Uh, I really, 
And I was just talking, I, I mentioned before the idea of big food and little food, and we were just talking about it last night, that um, it, I think that I really believe in um, like doing things that are, I think I'm really lazy is my answer. I think I'm really lazy. So for example, tonight, I believe I'm having 10 to 12 people over. I didn't like got the invitation, but that's fine. I get it. You did. So it's, you can blame your producer. I've been waiting to hear <laughs> yeah, back. I from need you. to blame somebody, but keep yeah. going. Uh, and um, so, but what, so the what way I, that so I'm so what I do is what I always tell people to do: uh, cook things that are really easy and that you can cook ahead. So I have a recipe for this in my book. There's a great way that I've been cooking like big pieces of meat that I learned from my brother that I call a lazy steam roast, but where you just season big, a big piece of meat really deliciously, and then you wrap it in parchment, and then you wrap it in tin foil, and you do it quickly high so that everything gets hot, and then you just leave it on low for like, you know, whatever, six hours. So there's meat cooking right now in my fridge, and when 12 people get here, there's going to be a braised pork shoulder, it's going to steam roasted pork shoulder, and, um, and ribs that are also steam roasted, and I make a big pot of beans which is also cooking right now. Um, and then everything is done. I always, I really believe in doing things that you can cook ahead and doing very little when people are there other than, you know, like a croquettes you do when people are there. Um, but everything else I like to make ahead and it, none of it is particularly impressive. It's just delicious. So I feel like um, I really like to focus on like large quantities of simple things that can be made ahead and are really delicious. And then if you're worried that it's all going to be kind of bushy and brown, which my food is like pork shoulder and beans, then you make like a little herb oil or something. And then, and I also, my, so, so make things ahead, big batches, simple preparations. And then I really like to get everybody to do something. I feel like that's a really, mm. um, that's a good one. So your philosophy is less is more in mm -hmm. terms of, you don't have to be making hundred dishes or 20 dishes. And more is less. If you're making something, make a ton. Yeah. Make a big pot of meat or the, the big ball of beans or the big roast in the oven. So it makes a, I don't think that's lazy. I, I think you're too hard. You know what is lazy? Lazy is, yeah, lazy is when somebody just gets on the phone from their sofa and <laughs> order, order food. It's far away more expensive and they get it delivered. And they open uh, from the Chinese local restaurant, which, by the way, we have all done it and it's great. That's lazy. Anybody that cooks, I don't, I, I will not call yourself lazy, but you are practical. I think it's that people Very often practical. don't realize that it, that this is an okay thing to do. You know, that it's fine. I mean, we I we normally have people over. We, we rarely have dinner, just our family. Our neighbors are always here and we have something that we call the meal plan, which is that like basically anybody can show up as long as for any meal, as long as they bring a bottle of wine. And so if people show up and I was, and I, you know, I didn't have something great planned or I'd said like, maybe I'll make Annie's mac and cheese, then maybe I just make grilled cheese and salad for everybody. But I feel like there aren't that many sort of publicly visible examples of people prioritizing just feeding people, which is what I'm, you know, I like to have like enough to drink and enough to eat. And I just, and you know, but it's often grilled cheese or eggs or, you know, roasted pork or whatever. And I, I think that knowing that it's okay to do that is maybe, you know, it's more that people don't know that that is an acceptable thing to do. Maybe it's not acceptable. I don't know. It feels like So you're going to have uh, a lot of, uh, maybe a lot of beans left over. Probably you have some of the meat left over. Uh, I think more and more people slowly are starting to pay more attention, obviously, thanks to the work of people like you to to what to do with leftover food but, but even i will go further uh, to what we call sometimes use food waste because if for uh, leftovers food if you use it is is great it's something you keep eating or reusing and creating sometimes even more amazing dishes than the initial dish this when that happens is very magical but what you don't use is use food waste and so what do you see as the relationship between the, the personal individual behavior? You know, like now we have asparagus stamps. Um, and I'm going to do something with them. Uh, and the larger problem of food waste and climate change. Like a very big mess. It's like 
seems everybody has to do something about it, right? Uh, and maybe some people are trying, even sometimes maybe challenging, because let's face it, I think I'm guilty as anybody. Yeah, sometimes I have food in my fridge that, because maybe I bought too much. The, the tomato juice goes rotten. Well, I put it in my compost bin, so I know I didn't eat it, but I know it's going to help make my soil in my mini garden I have outside my house or somebody else's garden uh, a good uh, compost that will help them produce uh, next season uh, great vegetables. So what I'm only trying to say is that, oh my God, people have to be overwhelmed. It's so complicated. The, the willingness to try to do the right thing versus feeling successful doing the right thing. I think that's, I think that, I think that we are all overwhelmed and, and, uh, and I think that is a really wonderful, empathetic way of talking about this huge problem because, uh, because there, so there are personal choices that you make at home and sometimes, and, and I think that we often talk in terms of guilt, which is, you know, like guilt and shame are not actually very good motivating factors, you know, so feeling guilty or, you know, doesn't, doesn't produce change. Um, which is one reason that on a personal level, I think it's, it's good to think of like, not what you're doing wrong, but just what you can do, right? Like if you have one, you know, if once you're like, I'm going to try to cook these asparagus bottoms, then that, I, that doesn't save the world. And you're not going to save the world by keeping your asparagus bottoms and you're not destroying the world by, um, by throwing them out. Compost is obviously great, but like if, you know, you're not destroying the world by putting them in a landfill because our food, the food production that we are currently engaged in on a global level is obviously far more responsible for climate change than um, at home food waste. And that, uh, that's important to remember. And I think that sometimes we actually overly emphasize individual choice um, because it's a lot easier to say, uh, you know, we, we, all Americans throw out 30 to 40% of our food every year. And it's so great that big corporations like Kroger are, um, are diverting wasted food toward food banks and stuff like that. And it doesn't, that it doesn't take into account that, um, much more food waste is happening just because of the way we distribute food and what we subsidized. So I feel like it's, you know, it's important to keep the, the actual structural picture and what's wrong with it front and center and to say clearly that we should change the food system um, regardless of what we're doing on a personal level. But it's also true that there's a kind of like, I feel like we're constantly in thrall to, like we're constantly um, at the whim of this this food system, which is really wasteful, if we can't if we don't have the skills to use all of what we have. So on one level, it's like we have to train ourselves up in what we can do with all of this stuff, what you can, what we can do with breadcrumbs, like fry them in pork fat, what we can do with asparagus bottoms, um, you know, braise them and puree them into soup. Because the more, the more we have that, the more I feel like sort of self-sufficiency and sovereignty we have and the more we can say, I'm not comfortable with this food system, but I don't need it because I actually can always make something with what I have. I would love to hear your answer to that question, though. I would love to hear what you think. Well, I'm sorry to tell you tomorrow, but I'm the one interviewing here. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, listen, um, and especially people like we work uh, in the food business, which is a very lame excuse, but at the same time, it's true. Um, when I go to the market, I always overbuy. I overbuy because I don't know when I'm going to have time to go back. And when I see something like, for example, I will buy Savoy cabbage every time I see them. Why? Because they keep very well in the refrigerator. I'm, I'm, I have good space in my basement and I have a big fridge and I know the fall is going to come and before I know winter, and then I don't have cabbage to make the different stews I like to make. So when I see Savoy cabbage, I buy them and I can find, you can find anywhere from two, three, four, sometimes six or eight. Why? Because, <laughs> yes, I'm guilty. I, I want, I love Savoy Cabo. <laughs> and, and they keep so well. And I keep them uh, wrapped and, and 
few weeks later, a few months later, they are still in good shape. I take the two, three leaves outside, and the rest is 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 amazing. So I'm very guilty of my own. Uh, I have a feeling, but also I'm doing research all the time. I'm, I'm 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 trying to learn what I have around me. If I see some flower sprouts, I buy them because I love them, and they are not so easy to get, especially from the local farmers around where I live in D.C. I love the capuchin flowers. I love the flavor. It's, it's like a salad of capuchin flowers and the sunflower seeds. Uh, sprouts with sunflower seeds is a salad that I love. Simple, nothing else. It's like, um, mm, it's like, it's like, oh my God, I feel like I am a cow. Uh, uh, it's like, yeah, I, I remember being young and eating grass because I saw the cows. I love milk. And I come from a milk producing region and I remember eating the grass and I thought it was wonderful. It's like, oh, it has to be so fun to be a cow. Anyway, I don't know where I'm going with this, but yeah, I'm guilty in the way that my profession sometimes makes me because books, because restaurants, because new recipes, because things I'm writing on or things I'm interested in. I buy because I, I, it's the way I can express myself. That's why I'm always looking for who wants to come home for lunch or dinner because in my house is always food and I'm guessing that this is what happening to you and um, when you have a lot of people home I heard I heard that you have a game a fun game <laughs> the left the leftover game now everybody understands here in longer tables what I call you what I call you the queen of leftovers especially with this new cookbook so how, how this game, the leftover game works? What is that game? Well, the leftovers game started when I published this last book, um, the Everlasting Meal Cookbook. I, every time I did a book event, I would uh, say, I think we should have everybody in the audience call out the name of a leftover that really, um, that really flummoxes them, that they don't know what to do with, or a problem that they have found in their home kitchen call it out and then usually the person who was interviewing me and I would come up with a solution really fast and then the next person would call out. Um, and so we would end up generating, you know, like 25 solutions in a really short period of time. And, and we would put ourselves on our, on our toes, which was, you know, kind of great. Wow. With a new artificial intelligence, that's going to be a fun, a fun one. I know. And I was thinking when I, I, I wish that there had been, you know, uh, public source AI when I was writing this cookbook, because I probably <laughs> could have gotten a lot of help. But, but, but. Did you try? Did you try already? I have a feeling you already tried. No, I haven't. I haven't. I, I'm uh, less let me tell you what, what we're going to do as soon as we finish this podcast. Definitely. We're all going to go and we're going to start. Okay. Uh, whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, but uh, a strawberry seeds. You know, I peel my strawberries. What? Yeah. Do you on. ever had a, a no. peeled strawberry? No. Okay. You you told me before that you put people to help when yeah. you bring people to do something. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, we all have that kind of even if he's a good friend, kind of that moment that you are concentrated in trying to feed everybody and somebody annoying asking too many questions, so you are annoying. Mm -hmm. And I always put them to do a few things like peeling garlic and start smashing it in the mortar, uh, peeling blueberries. I, I, I actually what? put blueberry. Yeah, you peel blueberries. They're so much better. Uh, you make a sauce with the skins, but then the blueberries, yellow, uh, greenish, uh, whitish, depends, uh, with that super red, reddish, purplish, whatever is the different colors of the different skins of the blueberries. Uh, oh my God, it's amazing. But I love to peel the strawberries. It's nothing like when your lips contact a skinless strawberry. You understand that the strawberry was created to be loved by you, by all. Because almost fits perfectly Gosh. into beautiful lips. Uh, a peeled strawberry, my friend. It's, it's, if, if, if you never had a peeled strawberry, you don't understand the strawberries. A strawberries... I told me personally one day we had a very very personal encounter they told me jose wh why you peel potatoes and you don't peel us why are we not treated in the same way wow and and they were right and i began peeling them and it's a new relationship with the strawberries 
I can't believe this. I can't believe I'm learning this. I'm going to remember this day. May 22nd is when I learned that I have not actually ever communed with a strawberry. <laughs> See, life is so amazing. Okay, so I have a stems of uh, broccoli. What uh, do we do with them? Okay, broccoli stems are amazing. I'll, I'll do one, then I'll give you one. Um, right. Okay, so I, uh, I love to chop them across the fibers and then braise them until they're soft, almost thinking of them like um well like a, like a much harder vegetable not thinking of them as the broccoli crowns but cooking them in a combination of water and fat and herbs until they're tender and you have to cook them until they're tender then you can actually eat them like that you know in in pieces um or you can puree them into a pesto and it ends up being like a fava puree like a green beautiful delicious um like spread for toast or to toss with pasta um okay wait what do you do with onion peels. Oh, that's it. You're gonna. But are, are you talking the <laughs> onion, onion, onion outside peel? Yeah. Or or the outer uh, leaves of the onion. Well, you can answer it however you want. It's your podcast. Yeah, because outside, <laughs> obviously, it makes a great. Uh, you know, you can the 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 older Spanish uh, onions. Um, you, when you boil them and you have a lot of them, you create this amazing pigment, this amazing yeah. color. And actually it has flavor. Uh, and when you start reducing that, you, and you reduce it and you reduce it. You can use it for whatever. I mean, you add some butter and you have a sauce of onion skins. But uh, I, I, I love when I, I roast entire onions slowly in the oven. Um, uh, uh, and this is not leftover. It's just I use the whole onion. Mm -hmm. You think about it. When you right. don't peel them, the outside becomes like a plate. All of a sudden, you don't need plates. When you finish them, actually, I have this dish with Vidalia onions that I fall in love from beautiful Georgia um, in my Spanish restaurants with uh, blue cheese. But anyway, when I, I get the tiny uh, onions and I roast them, well, in charcoal or in wood or in a traditional oven. And I cook them forever and ever. And ever and ever can be an hour, an hour and a half, two hours, three hours. And at the end, all the water evaporates and all the sugars begin getting caramelized inside. And then when you cut them and you open them, you just almost not need anything. The leaves almost separate themselves. Just you make sure with a knife you detach them from the little root in the bottom. And just you give that onion that is the plate, the skin outside is the plate itself that you can hold in your hand, like if it's a, the bomb of giving birth of a woman. And you go with a fork and you start eating that onion with a little bit of salt. That's it. That, that's it. You don't eat anything else. Now you have a vinegar of pow pow. I love vinegar of pow pow. You put a little bit of the vinegar Wait, of pow pow. Wait, pow pow? Is that what you're saying? Pow pow vinegar. Really? You never had pow pow? You never no, had pop vinegar? No, What's wrong with it? I don't know. Between this is and these the guys in Virginia, they make the best vinegars of the things. Wild persimmons. Oh. Wild persimmons, American wild persimmons. Pow pow, the most American ingredient America doesn't know about. Oh my God, there's so many. Yeah. Oh, or rams. Uh, I got some rams uh, pickle because rams just began and I love those pickle rams. Yeah. Uh, I love the pickle rams a year later because they are not so harsh. Oh my God, I love rumps. Anyway, my friend, yeah, we can have fun all day with this. You yeah. should do a, yeah, this needs to go somewhere. Leftovers game, yeah. You say potato, I say, what do I do with that? <laughs> all right, um, so last question. Um, um, I don't know because you are an a editor of one of the most amazing magazines and then all of a sudden, boom, you become a cook in a in a super cool restaurant, you are an investor in a restaurant and you become the head chef. Um, now you are uh, an amazing cook, chef, uh, food personality, cookbook author. I have a feeling like, well, boom, maybe we leave this podcast and you go and you become the chef in the ISS Space Station <laughs> or in the new city when they open a final place for humans to have a foot on the moon. I have a feeling you are that type of person. That sounds neat. I did go, I was in, um, I was in Finland a few months ago to write about a new protein 
that was it was Ooh. a bacteria that was found in the Finnish forest and it eats um hydrogen uh carbon and oxygen and turns them into protein and i cooked with a chef that they have in-house at this company it's called solar foods and it was really delicious so i yeah maybe maybe like interstellar they chef. were earthling so they were some kind of uh visiting a species from another world they looked like earthlings okay. but how you know who knows no you just check in uh sounds interesting i love to see that yes i do believe it's a space for in the alice waters way the most traditional taking care of our gardens of our farms of the people and eating in the way we've been doing for centuries but i think i love to see that these new ways new new people pushing forward new proteins that i know sometimes they look like alien foods but i think the most ideas we have to how to keep feeding a hungry planet uh, the best yes i think it's a space for everybody more traditional farming uh, but traditional farming has evolved over centuries we are not farming anymore in the way we used to do it 2000 years ago we are better at it but also we are putting the same knowledge to come with new ways so i I need to learn more about this company in Finland. Sounds yeah, super it's super interesting. And there are others too. I completely agree with you. And I think some people had a really bad reaction to my having um, written about it because, you know, they said like, well, this is, you know, rejecting traditional farming. Um, but like you said, farming didn't, isn't static. Like it didn't start at one point in time and end at one point in time. And also we, we can't go on with, we can't go on doing traditional agriculture um, because the planet can't withstand it. So I think we need all the solutions. So Tamar Adler, Thank you very much for being here to the family of Longer Tables. Her new cookbook, again, the Everlasting Meal Cookbook, Leftovers A to C, is a book you want to have. And it's a book you want to engage with. And hey, you saw her here. You can cook and feed yourself and your family and play amazing games. Any, <laughs> any moment, any day is always some leftover that needs your love. And you, Tamar, you're helping us to give love, even to ugly fruits and vegetables, or even <laughs> worse, leftovers. Thank you. Thank you so much. This has been a complete pleasure.